All right, morning, everybody. Um, I hope you've uh, had a coffee or are going to have a coffee. So uh, what was it? Name, Jared Simpson. Uh, where I am, I'm here at OICR. I'm a principal investigator. Uh, it means I run one of the research groups. Uh, my lab is situated pretty much just above this room on the sixth floor. Uh, Heather, uh, one of our instructors and TAs, is uh, one of my grad students. Uh, what we work on in my lab is uh, essentially developing software analyzing genome sequencing data. Uh, very appropriate that I'm giving uh, today's talks because that's essentially what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about some of the software that's been developed for mapping reads to reference genomes. And then later on this afternoon, uh, we'll talk about uh, genome assembly. Um, I also have an appointment as an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science across the street at the University of Toronto, uh, where I interact with other uh, sort of computational faculty to try to solve challenges associated with, with dealing with the very large data sets uh, that we have from uh, high throughput sequencers. Did I cover everything required for the introduction? Something not on your CV. Something not on the CV. Hmm. Ah, I'm a, according to my grad student, getting a dog. She, uh, she's been finding dogs for me for the last week uh, because my wife and I just bought a house. So uh, apparently that's time to get a dog, according to, to virtually everybody that I know. Uh, yeah, also, uh, Michelle, Michelle was miming out, and I'm also a rock climber. So if you can't find me uh, in the lab, you can find me at one of the local climbing gyms, uh, usually Rock Oasis, uh, Wednesdays and Saturday mornings. All right, so uh, let's, uh, let's get into the lecture then. Um, so just uh, some brief preamble. So all the slides are available through Creative Commons licenses. Uh, part of Creative Commons is that you attribute uh, individuals who contributed to uh, your materials. Uh, so here are my credits. So some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today uh, was originally developed for courses by Ben Langmead, uh, Johns Hopkins University, and Aaron Quinlan from the University of uh, Utah, so we appreciate uh, them making these open, openly available uh, teaching materials that everyone can benefit from. And if you're interested in, in sort of other topics in computational genomics, how to analyze sequencing data, uh, you can look at their uh, websites here where there's a lot of uh, additional material on other topics. <clears throat> so my topic to you here this morning for about the next, I'd say, 45 minutes to an hour is on mapping reads to a reference genome. So yesterday when Trevor uh, presented the introduction to cancer genomics, he had this figure in his slides where uh, he visualized data processing as sort of this pipeline where you put data, in our case sequencing data, in at the beginning of the pipeline, it f flows through uh, a number of steps and then at the end you get some results out, maybe some mutation calls, maybe a list of, list of driver genes, uh, or any other, other topics that we'll be covering uh, in the course. Now the focus of this lecture is about that very start of the pipeline. So when you first get sequencing data, maybe you've done a little bit of QC or quality control in the data, then what do you do with it? And the, main, the first step that most workflows will do are taking the reads and then aligning them or mapping them to, uh, say, a human reference genome, and then passing the alignments down to downstream tools like somatic mutation callers, which will identify uh, where the somatic mutations are. So many of you have probably run read mappers before. Who, who's run a read mapper before? All right, so maybe about, about a third quarter of the class. Um, the rest of, for the rest of you, you're going to have a chance to run a read mapper uh, in, in the practical session. But for everybody, what I, hope to, uh, what I hope you get from this is an understanding of uh, what we mean by talking about mapping reads to a reference genome, some of the terminology around mapping reads to reference genome. Uh, I'm a computer scientist by training, so I think a lot about how to design efficient methods are going to be able to very quickly and very accurately uh, align reads to reference genomes. I'm going to talk about the algorithms only at a very, very high level. I don't want to go into the details today, but if anybody's interested in that, I can talk about some of the techniques uh, in, in uh, the tutorial or in the coffee breaks. Um, I also want to introduce to you some of the main file formats that we use when talking about sequencing data. 
FASTQ format, that's the file format that sequencing reads come in when you get them from the sequencer. And then the SAM and BAM file formats are uh, how we represent reads aligned to a reference genome. Uh, we'll talk about some common terminology, things like base quality scores, things like mapping quality, paired end reads. I'll introduce all of these concepts and, uh, and discuss the terminology uh, throughout this lecture. And then finally, after I'm done talking, you'll get a chance to run a read mapper. Uh, our preferred read mapper is called BWA. It's written by Hang Lee. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And you'll get a chance to explore some mapping results on your own uh, and look at uh, some aligned data. All right, so I'd like to make this interactive as much as possible. Uh, I get really tired if I talk for just like an hour unbroken. So please feel free to just put your hand up and uh, just ask questions so you can make this as much of a dialogue as possible. And we have a question already. Thank you. Um, what about the BCL files, like the, the uh, Nexi instrument doesn't generate the Do you address that at all? Yeah, so usually what will happen is that um, so, so BCLs is a file format that Illumina Instruments output. Uh, I think it stands for base call likelihood. We'll talk about base calls a little bit later. Um, usually, like very, very early in the pipeline, someone will convert BCL to FASTQ. Uh, and then you'll, all of the downstream analysis tools, like these read mappers, BWA, like another read mapper called Bowtie, some, one that some people might have used or heard of, they all expect FASTQ. Uh, files as input. So there'll be a step sort of upstream, hopefully upstream of when you get the data that converts BCL to FASTQ. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, usually I think that it's, it's pretty much just a transformation. So the exact same information is in the FASTQ uh, as in the BCL and vice versa. It's just structured slightly differently. But like a larger question is, is what do we mean when we talk about the accuracy of sequencing reads? I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, and then maybe we can touch on uh, some of the some of the aspects of BCL. That's a good question, though. I want to come back to that. Anything else before before we go in? Is there anything that people want to hear about uh, in particular? Yeah. Right, specialized aligners for ancient DNA. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I know Trevor talked a lot about cell-free DNA yesterday. Um, sorry? A little, bit. a little bit. Okay, not a lot, a little bit. He mentioned it. Um, a lot of times, like, uh, this, this lecture today is going to be very much tailored for just, you know, bulk whole genome sequencing. Sort of, you know, the, what, we, what we expect the data to look like when we say we've sequenced a genome. When you have things like ancient DNA, which can be highly degraded, it has certain types of sequencing artifacts. You definitely have to handle that specially. Um, I'm going to try to work that in as I go, where you know you might vary vary from some of these pipelines that we're talking about. So I'll definitely try to cover that. Anything else people want to hear about? Yeah. Batch effects. I think we're going to have. Do Michelle is busy right now. Is is someone talking about batch effects sometime during this course? Like if there's not no, there's not like a special statistics part about batch effects. Okay, I'll try to bring that in. Usually, um, we think about that like a like a bit downstream of sort of the primary data analysis. So what we're going to talk about here today, and I think tomorrow as well, is taking your sequencing data and then generating, say, somatic mutation calls or copy number calls. Usually, when you work on batch effects, that comes in later when you're analyzing the results of maybe 50 to 100 sequence genomes jointly, then you need to think about things like, you know, are we seeing certain variants only sequenced from a one sequencing center versus another sequencing center? So I could try to, I could try that, bring that in, but it's a little downstream of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah? Are you going to talk about CRAM? Did you... CRAM, ah, yes, I can talk about CRAM. Let's, you... I'd like you to remind me of that when I talk about the BAM format uh, in about 40 minutes from now. Because that's that's definitely an interesting one and, and very topical for 2019. All right, so that's a good list of stuff to talk about. Uh, let's, uh, let's jump in. So I think the starting point is really how sequencing works itself. Uh, so this lecture is going to be entirely about Illumina sequencing. Uh, so as many of you are aware of, uh, Illumina is essentially the 
uh, market dominating sequencing technology. Uh, it has incredible throughput where you can sequence hundreds of gigabases, even up to a terabase uh, per run with the latest Illumina NovaSeqs. Uh, the reads are very, very accurate. They're accurate to about uh, 99 point, let's say 9% or one error per thousand bases. Um, they're very fast and robust. As long as you can extract DNA, uh, you can probably make a sequencing library and get it to sequence on uh, the Illumina sequencer. This is important for things like ancient DNA, where the DNA is very short, it's very degraded, uh, because you can amplify it and then get enough to sequence uh, on Illumina. Uh, but then it has the main disadvantage that uh, there's this inherent limit to the read length. You can only sequence about 100 to 150 bases per DNA fragment. Now, does anybody know why that's a limitation? That you can only sequence what we consider short reads. Might be a problem with deletion, so it might be difficult to detect um, <laughs> events that are larger than your read length. Definitely, that's a definite limitation. That's a good one. Any other limitations of only having really short reads? So, how big is the human genome? Three billion bases. So reads are, let's say, 100 bases. So about seven orders of magnitude shorter than your human genome. Um, now, the reason that this is important is that not only is the human genome very large, but it's also very repetitive. A lot of segments of the human genome, roughly 50% of it, are present in multiple locations of the genome. So that means that when you have a 100 base pair read, if it comes from one of these these repeated segments that are present in multiple copies, it's very difficult to say whether it came from this copy versus this copy. And we call this the repeat problem, the repeat mapping problem. It's going to be much more important when we talk about genome assembly uh, in the afternoon, but it's one of the main challenges of just working with short read sequencing is that you can't resolve uh, where the reads come from if they come from uh, some of these very high copy repeat uh, regions. <clears throat> With that in mind, there's been new sequencing technology developed. So, Jared, yeah. you mentioned 100 to 150. Yeah, so I say, I, I usually say about 100 to 150. Um, I think, you know, people have run my seeks out to about 300 bases, but you're not getting more than, you know, let's, let's say an upper limit of about 300 bases. And the amount of the genome that you can cover with a 300 base pair read versus 150 base pair read isn't, isn't that much. Uh, if with paired ends, you can do a little bit later. But the big jump is between the new single molecule, what we call third generation sequencers, uh, developed by PacBio and Oxford Nanopore, which can sequence 10,000 base pair reads or greater, which allow you to cover uh, much more of the genome uh, and more of the repetitive regions uh, of the genome. That's much more important for genome assembly, so I'm going to leave the entire discussion of long read sequencing uh, until this afternoon. So one of the main things I want you to get out of this lecture uh, is an understanding of some of the ways that sequencing can go wrong. Uh, so a lot of the concepts we're going to be talking about are relatively straightforward in the case where uh, you have perfect data and you know your genome uh, doesn't contain a lot of repeats. So I want to introduce you to the challenges that errors in your data might generate and things like repeats in your genome uh, might cause complications. So to start with that, I want to talk about uh, this cartoon look at how Illumina sequencing works. Uh, so the first step of Illumina sequencing, you take some genomic DNA and then you shear it using, say, sonication uh, or enzymatically down to uh, short DNA fragments of maybe 300 to 400 bases. We then take single-stranded template molecules, so those, uh, a single-stranded fragment, we call it a template, and we attach it to the surface uh, of essentially a microscope slide, which we call an Illumina flow cell, and the molecules are sticking up perpendicularly uh, to the surface of this flow cell. We're going to call each one of these our templates here. Then there's an in-place uh, PCR reaction to amplify these molecules, so that starting from this single molecule template, we get this bundle or cluster of identical copies of that same sequence, all localized in the same uh, region of our flow cell. You get maybe 10,000 copies of the molecule uh, per cluster. So in this little cartoon here, we have 
uh, two templates, and then they generate two clusters uh, from them. Now, Illumina sequencing is very similar to um, classical Sanger sequencing technology and that we're going to use uh, chain, chain terminating bases that are fluorescently labeled. Uh, one color for A, one color for C, one color for G, and one color for T. And then we're going to use DNA polymerase to uh, copy in complementary nucleotides uh, to these template molecules that are attached to the slide. So we're only showing uh, one, one molecule in the cluster here just for clarity. Um, but you can imagine these as a bundle of identical copies. So what's going to happen is we've got our fluorescently labeled nucleotides, we've got DNA polymerase, we add them to our flow cell. DNA polymerase is going to find the complementary base to the uh, first base of our, uh, our template molecule. It's a T, so the complementary base is A. For this one, it's a C, so the complementary base is G. You then uh, excite the fluorophore attached to the nucleotide, uh, with a laser and it's going to emit some light and then using very expensive digital camera uh, hooked up to a very expensive microscope you take a picture which registers the color uh, that was emitted by each one of those clusters. So we've got a flash of green light here and a flash of this uh, orangey yellow light uh, over here. Yeah? That is, yeah, so the, <clears throat> yeah, so, the, so the, P, it's, the question was, this PCR step, is it going to generate um, a complementary sequence as well? Yeah. So I think that the way that the Illumina chemistry works is that the, this is the five prime end down here, uh, and this is the three prime end down here, and I think that there's a bed of adapter molecules uh, that are all down here, and the bridge amplification, at least you know, for the Illumina high seeks, would bend the sequence like this, and then amplify in place, and then I think it would um, then cleave the three prime end, and they would all stand up again, and then copy in place. But yeah, you only want the you know, this template strand attached to your flow cell or else you're going to have this mixed signal. So yeah, I, I don't remember exactly how it works, but you end up with this cluster of single-stranded templates all with the same sequence and all with the same strandedness. Or else you'd get this weird, uh, this, this weird mixed signal. Yeah. Um, we've been describing some experiments from laser capture samples. Yep. So low input, we had the PCR amplified first before sequence. <coughs> right. That's separate than what you're yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, there's typically, uh, there's in a, in a typical Illumina pr library prep, there's two amplification steps. There's this amplification step that happens before you're generating your DNA uh, or expanding your DNA to enough concentration that you can, you can add to the flow cell. And then there's this in-place PCR step on the flow cell. Uh, that first PCR step is optional. If you have loads of input DNA, you can build what's called a PCR-free library which gives you less bias and coverage across your genome. Uh, but this step, this bridge amplification that happens on this flow cell uh, is, is necessary. You can't get away from this one. All right, both good questions. Um, so we, we're at this stage now. We've taken a picture of our flow cell and we've registered a flash of green light and we've registered a flash of orange light. Uh, and that allows us to sequence the first base. So this is the top-down view of our flow cell. We've registered some green light in this lower left quadrant and some orange light in the upper right quadrant. What then happens is that you uh, add a chemical or an enzyme to the flow cell that removes a, a blocking group from these nucleotides that were added that then allows the reaction to proceed to the second base uh, of your template. You then do uh, another addition of fluorescently labeled nucleotides and DNA polymerase, excite it with your laser, uh, capture uh, light. In this case, we see red in both colors, and then remove the uh, blocking group again. And each one of those uh, steps of chemistry is called a sequencing cycle. So in Lumina Sequencer, if you have 100 base pair reads, it runs for about 100 cycles, each cycle sequencing a single base. Did you have a question? Yeah, can you define what you mean by it? Yeah, so these are 
Uh, so, cla so, so the classic Sanger sequencing technology used what's called chain terminating or chain inhibiting bases, where they were nucleotides, they were chemically modified, so that when DNA polymerase copied them into uh, a, uh, a strand of DNA, they couldn't be extended any further. So the, sequen the copying reaction would uh, continue until it hit a chain terminating nucleotide, and then it couldn't be uh, extended any further. That's how Sanger sequencing uh, worked. In Illumina sequencing, it's called reversible chain terminating bases. So you have this blocking group on your nucleotide, it would get incorporated, but then you could enzymatically remove the blocking group to allow the reaction to proceed later. So it just allows you to control how many nucleotides get incorporated at every step of the sequencing. Take pictures. <coughs> and you take pictures at each step. Does that make sense? Uh, so, so it's a way of stopping so that we can take this picture and exactly. get on it. Yeah, so if you didn't have these, if you didn't, if you just use, you know, regular uh, DNTPs, regular nucleotides, when you added the nucleotides and DNA polymerase, it would just go and copy the entire, entire complementary strand. If you have a chain inhibiting one, it's going to copy exactly one base in. Then if you remove it, you get to uh, do the second base in, a, in the next cycle. All right, so at the end of this, uh, we have this, this, stack of images, one per base, one per cycle, and the uh, instrument has software, which is called a base caller, which is going to take these images, try to figure out where the clusters are in each image, and determine the color of each base. And using the map that, say, green is representing an A, uh, and so on, it can figure out what the sequence of each molecule was. Now, errors can creep into this process, and the predominant mode of uh, sequencing errors for Illumina sequencing is when these reactions get out of sync. So now we're seeing all the molecules in one cluster, <clears throat> and the idealized version of it, if this chain terminating, reversal chain terminating chemistry works perfectly, is that all of the molecules get the first base sequence, then we remove the group, all the molecules get the second base sequence, then the third base, and so on all the way through our DNA template. Uh, unfortunately, uh, chemistry is never this perfect, and what can happen is that some uh, of the nucleotides might not have that chain terminating base on them, and sometimes that chain terminating base may not be successfully removed, so some of your molecules in this cluster can either jump ahead by going too far in the sequencing reaction, and some can lag behind. So in this cartoon here, let's say we're on the second cycle, we're sequencing the T base in these two uh, templates, but this one has lagged behind by one step, so we're still sequencing that A base and seeing a flash of green light. Conversely, in this molecule, we've jumped ahead to the third base, maybe the chain terminating base uh, group was missing from this T, and we've jumped ahead to the G base. Now what's going to happen is when you take that picture, you're going to see this mixed signal of 50% red, 25% green, and 25% orange. And the base calling software is going to have to try to deconvolve that and figure out what the true base was at this, uh, at this cycle. Did you have a question? In that case, behind and ahead, this cycle 2 comes to cycle 3. Yeah. And then it keeps stacking this kind of mistakes. Exactly. So the, the mistakes compound as you... As the reaction proceeds from the first base to the hundredth base, more and more of your fragments get out of sync, and you have a more and more mixed signal. Um, <clears throat> if you've ever looked at a plot of the error rate of Illumina sequencing, it looks like this. At the five prime end, it's very flat. It's about maybe, you know, let's say one in 10,000 base errors. And then as you proceed along the reaction and get to the three prime uh, base, it goes up very, very sharply at the end. And that's because as the reaction proceeds, there's more chances for these molecules to get out of sync, and you see more and more mixed signal in these clusters. And it's very difficult for the base caller to figure out uh, what the true base was for these later bases. Yeah? Does that correlate with the phasing error? This is phasing. Yeah, yeah. This, the, 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 the term we use for this is phasing. I think pre-phasing is when it goes too far ahead, uh, and phasing is when it falls behind. Yeah? I guess two kind of questions. So one, this will be the same process for RNA also, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for RNA on Illumina, you you uh, convert to cDNA first, then it works exactly the same as this. And so, are you incorporating somehow the um, the 
places to make it stop the breaks, if you will, into the DNA and into the DNA itself? Or are you separating it out and attaching it to the nucleotides? I guess I'm wondering, could you have like free nucleotides floating around and bind to these in a sense? Um, like, like free naturally occurring nucleotides that don't have a fluorophore and don't have a... Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think it, it's sort of a question of reagent purity. Like we have, we have all of these nucleotides, which are the ones with fluorophores, which have this chain inhibiting group on them. Those are the ones we want incorporating. I guess your question is whether there's just regular nucleotides that can go into the reaction and, and, and uh, you know, cause issues. My guess would be probably, but the, the question is like, what's the rate? What's the proportion of those? And I, and I can't, I don't know that one. But definitely like, those are the issues. Those are the things that generate issues with the nucleotide sequencing is if you have this, these unobserved bases um, or, or bases that don't have this chain terminating group on them. All right, and so just to confirm, like this chain terminating group, is that in between each nucleotide? Sense. Yes. Okay, yeah. so each nucleotide that's been incorporated into it prior to going through this. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I can. I'll, I'll I'll try to dig up like where, like what the exact chemical structure is and put it in Slack if you're interested. Because it, it is kind of, just all pre-processed, right? Like, this is all like this is all you know the alumina. What happens on the alumina sequencer? What's happening in their like library preparation kits? Um, but like the. Why I'm, I've, I've, I've sort of gone through this is we want to understand this this error mode because you know you, you see this error rate where the error rate's going up at your three prime end and to understand why that is you need to understand why these molecules get out of sync. All right, all good questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, so. Um, for, for Sanger sequencing, you've got this chromatogram where you'd see the Sanger trace, where you see the, the peaks of color, uh, and you can figure out your sequence that way. Uh, we don't exactly get that from, uh, from Illumina sequencing. What we get instead are what we call quality scores, which are a measure of how, um, <clears throat> of, uh, how confident the base color is that what it predicted at a per certain position of the read is correct or not. And that's perfect leading uh, to the next slide, which is going to talk about quality scores. Um, so here is a FASTQ file. There's five reads in this FASTQ file. Uh, when you work with sequencing data, you, you look at these files a lot, far, far more than you ever thought possible. Um, and it's a pretty simple text format where each read is represented by uh, four lines. And the first line is the ID or the name of the read. The second line is the nucleotide sequence. So this is the sequence that the base caller predicted for one of these clusters based on these images that we saw. The third line is sort of a relic uh, from older sequencing technology. Uh, it's just a plus now, and we just consider it a placeholder, uh, which is largely ignored and just takes up absolute terabytes of disk space across the world. Um, and then for, finally, the thing I want to talk about, which is the quality scores. So the quality score represents how confident the sequencer was that, say, there was an A at the first position of this read, and it's assigned a quality score uh, of H. So I'm going to come back to this, uh, but I first want to talk about the scale that we use to represent quality scores. So it's called the FRED scale. It was developed by Phil Green, uh, pioneering sequence analysis uh, bioinformatician from the University of Washington. Um, and it's a logarithmically scaled uh, measure of how accurate the sequence is. And if we see a quality score in our reads of what we say Q40, it means that the base caller thinks there's roughly a 1 in 10,000 chance that that base is incorrect. If it's Q30, it's about 1 in 1,000 or 0.1%. Q20 is 1%. Q10 is 10%. And then for single-digit quality scores, they're uh, very, very low indeed. So essentially, you want, when you're looking at your sequencing data, you want your quality scores to be as high as possible. And with modern Illumina sequencing, typically the quality scores are around, uh, I'd have to look it up, but I'm going to just say around Q30 or maybe a little bit above, where there's this error uh, expected about 1 in 1,000 positions. Now, this is the, we use these, these numbers between, let's say, 0 and 40 to represent the quality of our sequencing data. But in our FASTQ file, we just have these single letters. 
Now the reason for this is that we just want to be able to represent our quality scores for each base using a single character. So each one of these quality scores lines up nicely with the base call that it represents. So we use uh, the ASCII character encoding system to represent these quality scores. And we do that by taking the quality score and then adding 32 to it and then looking it up in the ASCII uh, table. So quality score of H is probably representing about a Q, probably a Q40 base. Uh, down here, the three prime end quality score of uh, pound sign or hashtag, if you may, uh, is probably something like Q5 or Q10. We could look it up in an ASCII table uh, if people are interested. But essentially, you want these quality scores to be as high as possible. And if you, you're not comfortable with looking at these uh, ASCII character codes, and pretty much nobody is, you can look up uh, online converters from uh, ASCII characters to quality scores quite, quite easily. So to go back to your question, this is the way that we're representing the quality of our data. We don't have chromatograms or Sanger traces. We have quality scores, and then we, we can look at, say, the read the line to a reference genome and something like IGV. It's going to shade the bases uh, according to their quality score, and we can, we can make a prediction of how reliable they are. So if you're looking for somatic mutations, you want all of the reads, uh, all of the bases in the reads that have evidence for that mutation to have uh, a very high quality score in sort of the Q30 range. Okay, that is the end of talking about how luminous sequencing works. Um, is there, are there any questions before I move on? Yeah. Yep. Uh, if there are regions where you have multiple regions, so what if you have like a TTT, and then CCTTT, and then so, yeah. because if you're out of phase, it's not going to jump. Right. That's a great question. So the question is, how does the base caller uh, sort of estimate these phasing issues in regions of low complexity? Like if you just have a homopolymer run of all A's or all T's. Uh, and homopolymer runs are pretty much the universal problem for all sequencing technology. When we talk about long read sequencers uh, later on, they're sort of the biggest error for long read sequencers, is they're trying to estimate it off of just single molecules. Um, but definitely you can have this increased error rate in homopolymer runs because of the fact that you, you can't accurately estimate the phasing uh, because of that. I think it would be interesting, I know it's, it's, you know, I've worked on variant calling for Illumina data, and we have to treat variants in your homopolymer runs with a lot of caution. I'm not sure sort of in, you know, with the modern NovaSeqs, uh, whether this problem is fixed, but definitely that's, uh, you know, we worry a lot about it. variants. Can you call variants near long homopolymers for issues like that? Yeah. Um, so in relation Yeah, so strand bias is an interesting, interesting thing to come up, bring up, because when we do call mutations, and hopefully uh, when you get a lecture on somatic mutations, I think tomorrow, um, they'll talk about the importance of seeing mutations on both strands. So it's very common when you call somatic mutations or just you know germline variants um, that you observe the variant on both sequencing strands to get over these sort of strand specific errors, um, sort of particularly for homopolymer runs, if you have a homopolymer A on one strand, you're gonna have a homopolymer T on the other. So you, you know, you're still gonna have a homopolymer, maybe a T is slightly better behaved than an A, um, but it's not gonna entirely get around this issue if just observing it on both strands. Did you have a question, Bob? Yes, a very quick question. You said that you used the Orosinus spectral model, you used the to see the base in Yeah. You said that use the lasers, no? Uh, the, the question which I had is that even for the less intense lasers, the momentum transfer from the detail, is it a stronger than the base um, balance that it just responds to complete structure of the bases before just the elimination of the I'm completely unqualified to answer that. <laughs> that's like that's a really good question. Um, I, we can maybe talk about it later, but I, I don't know how, you know, the strength of the laser or sort of their emission spectrum or whether they're going to cause issues uh, like that, but it's definitely something we can look up and then, and then follow up later. That's a great question. All right, anything else about the sequencing tech? Yeah. So you've got, you've got a sequence, and in the beginning it's very high, uh, high quality, but in the end it drops down significantly. Yeah. Are you 
we look in IGB, does it, is it, are you just looking at a portion of the sequence then that came out, like FASTQ file? So, so typically you're going to look at a whole read, um, and if you know if if the reads in your FASTQ file like this, the aligner is going to try to align that entire read to your reference genome. Now, there's two caveats to that. The first is that sometimes people will do quality-based trimming, where they'll try to identify uh, low-quality sections of the read and then just remove it. So let's say you wanted a quality-based trim here and these, uh, these number signs um, are representing low quality scores, you might just truncate the read at this G base here and then throw away the rest of it. In that case, when you align into your reference genome, look at an IGV, you wouldn't see that tail. Um, that's not so common with, uh, with doing read-based mapping to a reference genome. You typically will just get the reads, align into your reference genome, and let the variant caller figure out whether it wants to use those segments or not. Um, what might happen, though, is that if there was a problem with the sequencing and this tail of the read or the suffix of the read is completely unreliable, like this, the sequence is nonsense, then the aligner might only align the read up to this position and then do soft clipping of the rest of the read and it won't be aligned to the reference. And when we look at BAM files later on, we can see examples of reads that have been soft clipped where it just wasn't aligned. It's a good question, though. All right, anything, any other questions? All right, so let's talk about what we're actually going to do with the sequencing data. <clears throat> so typically our goal, particularly when we're analyzing cancer genomes, uh, is to discover genetic variation, which are differences between the individual genome that we've sequenced and uh, some reference genome or some population of reference genomes. <coughs> and uh, to do this, we typically want to take our reads and compare them to the reference genome. So we might take our read, figure out where it came from in our reference genome, and then look for places where the read differs from the reference. And here I'm just drawing this alignment here, showing this vertical bar when these bases match up. And then there's no bar here because in our read we had a T, and in our reference genome we had a C. So this could either be caused by one of two issues. Maybe the individual had a SNP or a somatic mutation at this position, which was a C to T SNP, or this is a sequencing error. And pretty much all the work in uh, this primary bioinformatics is going to be trying to work out whether these mismatches here are SNPs or sequencing errors or somatic mutations. Uh, now there's two main classes of algorithms for analyzing your data. We could either take all of the reads themselves, perform a genome assembly, de novo assembly of the reads, then compare the resulting assembly to our reference genome, or we can individually map read by read and then look at the pattern of the alignments to try to discover variation. Uh, the read mapping approach, where we take our reads and compare them to our reference genome, is by far the most common for analyzing uh, cancer genomes using Illumina sequencing data. Uh, so we're going to talk about that problem uh, this morning. And then later on, as I mentioned, we'll talk about the other approach where we do uh, genome assembly. All right, so to do this, we need to figure out where our read best matches to our reference genome. So it's a bit like, I don't know, let's say um, looking through our lecture notes for a particular page or topic. So let's say you wanted to remember you know, you couldn't remember who gave the lecture for module four, so you type, might take all your lecture notes, flip through until you find module four and look it up and you see, okay, it was Jared Simpson. Now, <clears throat> to map reads to a reference genome, to find where the read places on a reference genome, we need to use really sophisticated algorithms because the scale of doing this matching problem of trying to find where in our reference genome each read came from is just huge. A Lumina sequencer might generate uh, let's say a billion reads and the human genome is three billion bases in length so there's no way we just take each read and compare it to every position of our reference genome uh, to figure out uh, where that read came from so we're gonna have to use uh, data structured which are, which are called text indices or text index uh, to do this so the main challenges for uh, mapping reads to a reference genome is that the genome is very large very repetitive Naive algorithms, like trying to compare the read to every position of our reference genome, uh, is just going to take too much time. 
And we also have this problem where we need to uh, avoid comparing a read to every copy of a repeat within the genome. So let's say we have our genome here. Let's say these three red segments are repeats, and we get a read that comes from one of these repetitive segments. So we don't know where the read can come from. It could have come from repeat copy one, could have come from repeat copy two, or it could have come from repeat copy three. And the mapping algorithm, the software we're going to use to map the, the reads, is going to have to uh, very quickly decide whether it can be uniquely mapped to any of these locations, and if not, flag it as a read that comes from a repetitive region. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, so third challenge when mapping reads to our reference genome is uh, something we've already briefly discussed before. Uh, reads contain sequencing errors. You know, there's this error, increase in error towards the three prime end of the read, and they also contain SNPs and indels. So the reads aren't going to perfectly match your reference genome. We can't just assume that our 100 base pair read is going to be uh, an exact 100 base pair match somewhere in the reference genome. So the mapping algorithm needs to be able to find inexact alignments where we allow some differences between our read and our reference genome, like this SNP we saw here, C to T, uh, or even larger differences like insertions and deletions. Uh, general principle is that it's much easier to align reads that contain mismatch bases or substitutions than it is to align reads that contain indels. Now the effect of this is that when you're calling mutations uh, off of Lumina data, it's much easier to identify somatic substitution mutations than it is to identify somatic insertions and deletions. So if you have uh, a list of somatic mutations, uh, somatic indels coming from a mutation caller, it's typically going to be much lower accuracy than uh, if you were uh, looking at somatic substitutions. So that's an important thing to keep in mind when looking at your own data. All right, so I, I started in bioinformatics around 2008, a little over a decade ago. Uh, this is when uh, Illumina sequencing first became available and really uh, became widely adopted in the genomics community. And an incredibly popular uh, bioinformatics problem to work on is this trying to efficiently map reads to a reference genome uh, without making a lot of errors. And I think hundreds of different mapping software have been published over the last 10 years uh, that have various trade-offs between being very fast or being very sensitive. So finding uh, most of the true alignments or true mapping locations in your uh, data. But luckily for us, we don't need to benchmark 200 different mappers to try to figure out which one to use for your project uh, because the field has widely adopted uh, software from Hang Lee, which is called BWA, and particularly a sub-program of BWA, which is called MEM, which stands for Maximal Exact Match. Uh, the reason that BWA is now the best practice for Illumina data is very well supported. It was developed... Uh, I think BDMA MEM came out in around 2011. Um, so it's been used so widely used in the community that basically all the bugs that can be found in this program have been found uh, and eliminated by now. So it's very robust, very stable, and it's very fast. And because it's been adopted as a standard for mapping reads, uh, most downstream tools like SNP callers and like somatic mutation callers uh, are designed to expect alignments or mappings uh, from BWA. And then a more technical reason of why uh, it's a great choice for mapping is it uses an advanced data structure which is called the FM index to avoid this problem of having to uh, efficiently map a read to all copies uh, of a read peak. Uh, I teach a grad class in the computer science department which basically spends four weeks on just describing how these data structures work. So I'm not gonna talk about it here. Uh, but if anybody's interested in, in sort of how this FM index solves this repeat mapping problem, I'm happy to talk about it in the break. Yeah? Just confirm, um, you can convert from other types of like uh, mapping software to the like, data structure. Um, so the, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit later about the, the file formats we use to represent mappings, which is called SAM and BAM. And every sequence aligner outputs their alignments in the SAM and BAM format so that if you want to use an alternative mapper uh, and then put the calls through mutex to somatic mutation caller, you can because they're in, in SAM and BAM. Um, the reason I said this, that the tools are designed 
uh, to expect alignments through BWA is that there's some subtleties and things how it handles you know corner cases and a lot of you know all the corner cases have been worked out with BWA mappings uh, in mind. Yeah. Sure. Here. Right. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in a couple minutes when we talk about mapping qualities. Um, but the 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 FM index in particular is a pre-processing algorithm where we take our reference genome and we perform what's called the burroughs wheeler transform to take this long linear string and then uh, essentially convert it into a sorted data structure that can be efficiently searched where all copies of a repeat are contained in the same region of the FM index. So if you have some you know, some ALU repeat, which is present a thousand times in the human genome, BWA can essentially align simultaneously to all copies of uh, the reference genome. And it will have this understanding from the output of this FM index transformation of how many copies there are of that repeat. And then it can decide whether, you know, it scores better to this copy of the repeat versus another copy. And this is sort of the behind the scenes magic uh, that makes BWA so fast. And this, you know, I, I don't want to undersell um, you know, the technical details of these because it was incredibly important to develop this, this FM index um, mapping uh, algorithm to solve this problem because back when we had, you know, the first aligners in 2008, 2009, they're really quite slow, but this, uh, this new data structure uh, drastically sped up the, the whole mapping process that we could run it on just a laptop, as we'll see later on. All right, good questions. Okay, so um, let's actually, we're, we're going to go right into uh, your, the first part of your question, which was how to uh, determine what the best mapping is. So uh, the point of this part of the lecture is uh, to give you an understanding of some of the pitfalls of read mapping and what to look out for uh, in your data. So I'm going to discuss this through uh, these cartoons of different uh, mappings uh, for example, reads. So we have a read here called read A. It's about 20 bases in length with a sequence A, G, T, A, A, C, T, and so on. Now, our mapping algorithm, like BWA, has found a candidate mapping location to chromosome 10 in position 1020, and it found a candidate location in chromosome 2, position uh, 2139. Now, the mappings aren't perfect. There's some mismatches here. One of them has a mismatch at the fifth base, uh, the mapping to chromosome 10, and the other one has a mismatch near the end, uh, two mismatches adjacent where this GT was uh, mismatched to TC. Now it's the job of the mapper to uh, figure out which of the two mappings is better. Now naively we would look at this and say, okay, well one mismatch uh, is better than two mismatches, uh, so it's more likely that this is the correct mapping to chromosome 10 than this one to chromosome 2. But then again, we might think, well, sequencing errors are more likely the three prime end of the read, so maybe it's more likely that these two mismatches are sequencing errors versus this single mismatch early on at the beginning of the read. Now, we don't know. This was just an example I made up for illustration, but the mapper like BWA, needs to formalize this process and try to give you some measure of the confidence in the two uh, possible alignments. And BWA, and then Hang Lee in particular, uh, pioneered a score which is called the mapping quality, which just like base quality is an estimate uh, of the probability that the chosen mapping for the read is incorrect. And it's the exact same scale as the base quality scale where 40 means there's a 1 in 10,000 chance, uh, QT 10 means there's uh, a 1 in 10 chance. So BWA is going to look at the pattern of mismatches, look at the quality scores of the mismatches, 
It will have some model of the prior probability of observing a SNP in the human genome, which is about one in a thousand, and integrate that into a final score that weighs the probability this mapping is correct versus this mapping is correct. And here we've assigned this one a mapping quality of 10, and this one a mapping quality of 1, where 1 being a very low score. So BWA choose this mapping to chromosome 10 as the uh, best alignment, and it would put this mapping quality uh, in the BAM output file so that the downstream tools can have some estimate of how confident BWA was uh, in this mapping. No, that's a really good question. Um, this, this calculation is done on a per-read basis. So something you might think, and their programs, their post-processing pro programs that will do this, is that there's, a, you know, you, there's two models here, that this is a SNP here versus this is a sequencing error. So if you had more reads that also have a mismatch in the same position, then that will give you, you know, confidence that this is actually a SNP, and you might weigh this mismatch differently than if it was a sequencing error. Um, but it's really computationally expensive to try to jointly look at all of the reads. So uh, all the mappers make the decision. They're going to look at it read by read and just have some prior probability that there's a SNP there. But you definitely could do some post-processing to try to, uh, try to, to you know, weigh evidence from other reads. All right, so any, any other questions about mapping quality? All right, so, yeah, so I said this already. Um, right, so sometimes we get reads that are perfectly ambiguous. So here's another example uh, where there's another read, also called read A, which has a mapping to chromosome 16 and a mapping to chromosome 3. And for both reads, or both mappings, there's a G to A mismatch, about two-thirds of the way down the read, in the same position. Now, this is this fundamental repeat problem. So this means that this short segment of the genome is present in two different locations of the genome with the exact same sequence. So the mapping algorithm has no information to figure out which of the two mappings is correct. We call these ambiguous mappings because they're uh, perfectly equivalent with no way of determining the true sequence. Now the way the BWA handles this is that it's going to randomly select one of those ambiguous mappings to output into our BAM file, and it's going to give it a special mapping quality of zero. A mapping quality of zero flags it as being an ambiguous mapping that can't be trusted. So if you're ever looking at alignments in a BAM file, if you see reads are mapping quality of zero, you should automatically think that those reads are repetitive and you can't rely on them to call variants. Um, now a, a common pitfall is that if you have these mapping quality of zero reads, you might want to know where the read might have also aligned to in the reference genome. Unfortunately, um, for really high copy repeats like simple nucleotide sequences, STRs, you know, homopolymer runs, if you try to align a read from one of these super high copy repeats and output all possible mappings, you're going to get millions of mappings for these, uh, these repetitive reads and the size of your output files are going to be huge. So, uh, Hang Lee made the decision that it's just going to output one randomly selected uh, mapping and then flag it as being unreliable. So you're not getting all possible alignments for the read or all possible mappings for the read. You're only getting one. Right. <clears throat> so Francis brought this up at the beginning. Uh, there is something we can do to help this situation, and that is generate what we call paired end reads. So we have this in, in inherent read length limit to Illumina sequencing where you can sequence you know, 100 to 300 bases, but it has a feature where you can take a DNA fragment and sequence 100 bases from one end and 100 bases from the other end of the DNA fragment uh, to generate this uh, paired end read where you have one sequence here, then some unknown sequence in the middle, and then another read at the end. Now, we approximately know the length of the DNA fragments. They're usually you know, 200 to 400 bases in length. And if the uh, read mapper knows that the reads are paired together, it can use this information to constrain the alignments and help resolve some of these ambiguous mappings. So let's go back to this example, chromosome 16 and chromosome 3. We have this read which is ambiguously mapped. 
if we took uh, a read pair from this DNA fragment, we might see that the second half of the pair maps much better to the downstream sequence of chromosome 16 than to the downstream sequence of chromosome 3. Now, the fact that we don't know the sequence in the middle doesn't matter. All we need to know is that this sequence was followed by a gap of about 100 bases to 200 bases, followed by this sequence. And since they both have good alignments to chromosome 16 in close proximity, BWA is then able to resolve that the true mapping uh, was chromosome 16 versus chromosome 3. So using these read pairs allows us to convert what are, would be ambiguous mappings to unambiguous mappings. Yeah? Is this using different chemistry? I'm trying to understand how the machine knows what pair, how, what sequence belongs to which. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I used to know how the paired end chemistry works. Uh, I don't anymore. It comes down to like we were talking about how you get just the same you know, five prime end on the flow cell, the same template molecule, where you have this bridging PCR, where like the three prime end goes to three prime adapters on the flow cell. Um, it's, it's in that process where you sort of bend the, the template molecules down onto the flow cell. I could look it up and drop a link in Slack of how the, 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 the you have to use the tell the, yeah, you have to, you have to tell the sequencer that you want to do paired end reads versus single end reads. Most whole genome sequencing applications do paired end reads just because it's so useful. Uh, and as you'll see later, it's not just useful for, um, for, for resolving ambiguous mappings, but it's also useful for, for calling structural variation. Um, so, so usually it's paired end unless, you know, you have a special application where you, you might only want to single end reads. Yeah? So what happens when those mutations Yeah, you don't observe them. You, you can't. So you, you'll have other reads that might start in this gap, um, but for this individual read pair, you don't observe any of this sequence, so you can't say, you know, anything about but what, what goes on in here. But this is just a single read or single read pair. Um, you're sequencing a billion read pairs per Lumina run, so if this one doesn't cover the gap, you know, some some other ones will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you, you have a long DNA fragment of 400 bases, some, you know, on flow cell chemistry happens so that the DNA gets bent into this, this, you know, bent molecule where the five prime end is one part and the three prime end is one part. And then the sequencing reaction starts from the five prime end, proceeds for 100 bases, and then it starts from the, uh, complementary strand at the three prime end at the other one which reads for 100 bases. The total length of the DNA fragment is maybe 400 bases, so you've read 100 bases from either end of a 400 base fragment, which gives you 200 bases that are unobserved. <coughs> All right, so we're coming to the end here. What time is it? 10, just about, just about right. Uh, last thing I want to talk about before we go into the practical is the SAM and BAM format. Um, so SAM stands for Sequence Alignment Map. Uh, as I mentioned throughout the lecture, uh, this is the file format for storing reads mapped to our reference genome. SAM is a text format, which means it's human readable. You can uh, open it up in the text editor. You can use various Unix tools to uh, transform it and manipulate that file. Uh, but it's very inefficient to store on disk. The file sizes are huge. So there's a binary version, which is called BAM, which is what we usually use to store our sequencing data. And in the practical, we're going to see how we convert SAM files to BAM files. Most aligners will natively output BAM, so it goes directly to this binary format, and then you can use a program called SAM tools to view uh, the text representation of your alignments uh, for regions of interest. So here's what a SAM record looks like, uh, and I'm gonna walk through fields one by one. So this should all be on one line, but because uh, you know, the screen would be too wide, I've, I've broken it up into three lines here. So the first field is just the read ID. So if you think back to the beginning when we talked about that FASTQ file, uh, the first line of the FASTQ uh, was the identifier for the read. That's copied directly into the SAM file here. The second uh, column is what we call uh, the flag. 
This is a binary bit mask, which compactly represents um, just single, single variable flags, like whether the read aligned to the forward strand of the reference genome or the reverse strand of the reference genome, whether the read had a pair, and whether the pair was mapped uh, successfully. Uh, it's just a compact way of representing these different states of the read. Uh, later, I'll send you a link to how we convert from this flag to some human readable uh, output. All right, next is the location of where the read mapped to. So the chromosome, this read mapped to chromosome 19, and the position along the chromosome, which here is 8.8 .8 megabases. Uh, next along is the mapping quality. So this is the mapper's uh, estimate of how reliable the mapping is. This read mapped with Q60, which means the mapper estimated there's about a one in a million chance that this mapping is incorrect. When you have paired end Illumina reads, uh, a very high proportion will map with Q60, where you know the mapper had uh, very high confidence uh, in the mapping position that it uh, that it shows. Is that the maximum? That is the maximum. It won't estimate higher than Q60, um, so it's probably slightly underestimated, but. Um, but yeah, it is difficult to estimate, you know, very rare events, so it, it can't go beyond that. Next along, we have the cigar string. So the information up to this point is just telling us where in the reference genome the read is. But we also want to know how the bases of the read line up against the bases of the reference genome. So I drew these pictures before where we have these vertical bars drawing the alignment. This cigar string is a compact representation of how that read should be lined up against our reference genome. So the cigar string for this read is 76M. Uh, the read is 76 bases in length, and every base of the read is matched up one-to-one -one against the reference genome from end-to-end. -end. So there are no gaps in the alignment, no insertions and deletions. If you have insertions and deletions in the alignment, like these two uh, diagrams I put at the bottom here, you're going to get a cigar that has these D and I operations. So the alignment here uh, of this read against the reference genome says that there's four M, so four matches, one, two, three, four, then one D, one deletion, so we ignore this reference base by putting a gap here, followed by another six matches, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is just a very compact uh, disk space friendly way of representing how the, the bases of the read line up against our reference genome. Here's an example with uh, an insertion into the read. So we have four matches, uh, one base insert, and then another four matches. Does anybody know something odd about this? Notice something odd about this one on the right. I purposely did something tricky here. Insertion. It's an insertion. So this is an insertion here. So we've said one I. Yeah. So this T is inserted here. There's a point Sorry? I think somebody said the answer There's here. A point There's a point mutation, yes. This second base is different between the read and the reference genome. The reason I put this trick in here is because it's a really common mistake to make is thinking that M stands for match and meaning that the uh, base between the read and the reference unit is identical. It doesn't. It just means that they were matched by the aligner, which means that they were lined up against each other. It doesn't mean that they have the exact same nucleotide sequence. Um, this is a design choice made very early on in SAM and BAM format. And it's very confusing. You might want it to say something like, you know, one identical base, one mismatch, two identical bases, one insertion, four identical bases, but for reasons of disk space efficiency, they decided to encode uh, identical bases and mismatched bases using the same operator, which is this M. It trips up a lot of people, which is why I spend time talking about it here. All right, so moving on, uh, the next three fields all deal with uh, the paired and reads. So if you've sequenced a read pair, uh, it will tell you the chromosome that the read pair aligned to. There's an equal sign if it's the same chromosome, and then the position along that chromosome, and then the length of that DNA fragment as calculated by the length of the alignments, or sorry, the distance between the alignments. 
So the insert size of 119 means that these two reads came from uh, 119 base pair fragment of DNA. And then finally, we have the read sequence itself, just like in the FASTQ file, and then the quality string, also just like the FASTQ. All right, any questions about the SAM format before we wrap up? What's the end at the beginning? Uh, what's the end at the beginning? That's a good question. Um, so N stands for an ambiguous nucleotide. Uh, essentially, the base caller wasn't able to confidently predict what base was inserted in the first cycle, so it's introduced this N symbol here. So that one, uh, it's, 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 we don't know if it's A, C, G, or T, so we represent it with an N. We have many questions. We'll start here. Could you have another operand besides the equal sign there? Like, would there be another outside of it being on the same chromosome? I think that it's either equals if it's the same chromosome or the identifier uh, of the chromosome directly. So if the read pair was, you know, this read was mapped to chromosome 19. If this was mapped to chromosome 2, it would say 2 here or whatever the, the ID uh, of, the, of the reference it is. So it's either equals or chromosome name. So what would be the point of doing it? I guess that's with either cis chromosome or going to another chromosome. Are you doing what would be the purpose of doing that at this step? If, from my understanding, you're looking to pair it so you can imply something about it based off of a chromosome or a, yeah. a sequence that follows it. So if it's on a different chromosome, I guess what's that purpose? So when, when we talk about structure variation later, um, major class of structure variation or translocations between different chromosomes, you know, Trevor probably talks about this later on, uh, reads that one half maps to one chromosome and the other half maps to another chromosome are evidence for there being a translocation. So that's you know what it's giving you right there. Um, of course, you wouldn't you, you wouldn't just look at one read pair, and if there's you know 19 to chromosome two from one read, that's not enough evidence. You'd look for many reads that map to the same position, where one half is mapped to chromosome 19 and the other is chromosome two to, to call a structure variation. Francis. So from a van file, you can totally recreate the fast file from one from one space Yes. Oh yes, cram. Um, great, great. Uh, I'll answer the first question first. Um, so most read, most aligners, and most mappers like BWA will output reads that can't be mapped to the reference genome as well. So every read that was in your FASTQ file will be present in your BAM file, even if it doesn't align to any chromosome because it's novel sequence uh, or the maybe sequence called it was too low to be able to align it. So that will be indicated in this flag field here. Uh, there'll be a flag that says the read was not mapped. Now there's programs like SAM tools, um, I think SAM to FASTQ, which will take a BAM file and convert it back to the original FASTQ file um, that, that the sequencer generated. The reads will be in slightly different order, but you can still you know, go back to FASTQ from your, uh, from your BAMs. Uh, and then the CRAM format. So this file format, BAM, requires about one byte of disk space per sequenced base. Typical Illumina sequencing run might sequence 100 gigabases, so your BAM files will be about 100 gigabytes in size. Um, after BAM was developed, uh, Ewan Burney at the EBI and his student Marcus Fritz uh, developed a new way of encoding alignment information which allows it to be compressed better. And it uses reference-based uh, compression to shrink the size of this alignment information. The way it works is that if you have a read that exactly matches the reference, you don't need to actually store the read sequence. You can just say, this read is a substring of the reference from this position to this position. And you save a lot of space by encoding the reads this way. Uh, and this is what's called the CRAM format, which I don't know, the C probably stands for compressed you know, compressed reference alignment map, something like that. Um, and it's growing in adoption to uh, just save, save sequencing cores, save genome centers space by outputting their alignments in CRAM instead of BAM. The reason it wasn't adopted uh, very quickly is that um, access to the reads used to be a little bit slower, but they've done a lot of work in engineering the CRAM format to be just as fast as BAM. So a lot of pipelines are now switching over to just just using CRAM, uh, and it's typically used for archiving data. So if you send your sequencing data to the EBI or the NCBI, 
they're going to convert it from BAM to CRAM so that, uh, you know, their, their enormous uh, disk bill is a little bit lower. Yeah. Uh, I would have to look that up. Yeah. A lot of the information is actually, it's very difficult to store the quality string compressed. Um, so pretty much all the remaining, uh, the remaining size is in these, in these quality scores. Uh, so people are working on ways of, you know, instead of using eight bits to represent a quality score, you might use fewer bits, but you lose some precision. Back there and then come back here. Uh, so let's say you wanted to look at your original FastQ and take a cram file. Would you have to go cram to BAM and then to FastQ in order to look at those original files? No, we're going we're gonna to work with some tools later on um, that will allow you to directly view parts of your BAM file. All those tools work the exact same way for cram files as well. Um, so the, the main tool package that we're going to talk about, uh, which I have on this slide, uh, is called SAM Tools. Um, you know, I, I've put in here, in, it's a toolkit for working with SAM and BAM files. It supports CRAM as well. So you can use the exact same set of tools on, on CRAM files as you can on BAM files. Do you have one? So in SAM tools, when you're making BAM files, it's also generate the BI files together. Uh, which file? By BAI, BI files. Uh, BAI, yeah, that's a good one. So um, often something we want to do is, uh, you know, not just look at the entire BAM file in its entirety, but we only want to look at, you know, chromosome 19, position 8 million, which we were just looking at. So there's a command called SAM tools view, which we're going to be working with, where you give it a genomic coordinate, and it gives you all of the reads aligned to that genomic coordinate. Um, to, to make that work, we need to develop an index that tells us where all the reads are in the file for particular segments of our reference genome. That's what's called the BAM index which has the suffix dot BAI. Um, to generate those, you run a program called SAM tools index on a BAM file, and it'll generate that, that dot BAI file. Uh, we'll see, you'll, you'll run those programs in the practical session.